This is Story Recapped. Today, I'm going to explain an action, sci-fi, thriller film called Red Planet. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. With the Earth suffering from an ecological crisis, scientists began a terraforming project on Mars to turn the planet into a new home. For over 20 years, several unmanned probes seeded the planet with algae to produce a breathable atmosphere. The project seemed to go well, until the oxygen levels suddenly dropped. The international community assembled a team of scientists to go on the first manned expedition to the Red Planet to find out what went wrong. Lieutenant Commander Kate Bowman leads the mission while Dr. Bud Chantales serves as the Chief Science Officer. Lieutenant Ted Santon joins the team as Bowman's co-pilot. Other crew members are the terraforming specialist, Dr. Chip Pettengill, a geneticist, Dr. Quinn Birkenall, and the ship's engineer, Robbie Gallagher. 93 days into their journey, the crew members can no longer see Earth from their space station, Mars One. During a walk around the ship, Gallagher tells Chantalas that his father would probably disapprove of their mission because he doesn't like using things he didn't build with his own hands. Chantalas points out that the Earth will soon die and take arts, religion, and other beautiful ideas along with it if they give up. Chantalas has turned to philosophy after realizing that science couldn't answer the most important questions. When Gallagher enters the bathroom, he gets embarrassed upon walking in on Bowman as she comes out of the shower. Bowman, on the other hand, doesn't flinch. She asks Gallagher to pass her the towel and advises him to pretend that she's his sister. Gallagher remarks that he has two sisters, and none of them look like Bowman. After over a hundred days, Gallagher performs a diagnostic check on Amy, a military robot designed to help them navigate Mars' terrain. Pettengill tests Amy's military reflexes, but the robot doesn't respond. Gallagher decides to demonstrate the robot's capabilities by changing its configuration to military mode and instructing it to attack Pettengill. Amy lunges at Pettengill, but he's not hurt because Gallagher only armed the robot with a pen. Gallagher notes that the military took away Amy's knife, but it's still capable of fighting. On day 182, Mars One finally reaches the planet's orbit. As they search the planet for the artificial habitat, Hab One, a gamma burst, hits the space station. Bowman immediately orders all crew members to go to the safe area to shield them from the radiation. After the solar flare passes, the crew learns that their power levels are dwindling, so Bowman instructs the crew to launch the Mission Extension Vehicle, or MEV, before the power goes out. After the crew boards the MEV, Bowman tries to activate the auto launch system, but it won't respond due to the lack of power, so she stays behind to launch it manually. As soon as the MEV leaves the space station, the AI Lucille warns Bowman about several electrical fires in several sections of the ship and the loss of artificial gravity. To add to Bowman's woes, the Gamma Burst destroyed their automated fire extinguishers. Bowman manages to put out a blaze manually, but the other sections are still burning. Meanwhile, Santon has difficulty landing the MEV, so he abandons their landing gear which also houses Amy. Soon after Santon deploys the airbags, the MEV touches down on Mars but it rolls down a canyon before finally settling down on level terrain. Back in Mars One, Bowman straps herself to the emergency evacuation unit and opens up a hatch to let the vacuum suck out the fire from the ship. After getting back inside, Bowman reroutes the power supply to restore the ship's artificial gravity and atmosphere. Without Amy, the crew has no way of navigating the planet. Gallagher compares a panoramic photo taken from the site with their current terrain to locate Hab One. As they prepare to leave, Chantalas announces that he can't go with them because his spleen was ruptured during the rough landing. He points out that they might not make it to have one with their limited oxygen supply if they carry him. Chantalas tells Bowman not to worry about him because he's happy that he got to see Mars. As the crew goes on their way, they notice no sign of any algae in the valley. Birkenall argues that they should see traces of the algae even if it all died, but there's nothing there at all. Not far from their location, Amy busts out of the landing gear and deploys a drone to find the team. The crew eventually locates Hab-1. But to their dismay, the facility has been mysteriously destroyed. Santin stresses that a storm couldn't have destroyed the habitat because the facility has been tested to withstand extreme weather conditions. Bowman also discovers through the monitors that Hab-1 is in ruins, so she contacts Houston to report that the crew has no means to survive on Mars. With only about 16 minutes of oxygen left, the crew opens up about their life on Earth to each other. While staring at the canyons, Pettengill tells Santon that he was supposed to be engaged upon his return. He wasn't even supposed to be on the mission, because his name was not the first on the list of terraforming experts. Santon asserts that his flying ability couldn't be blamed for their imminent death because the destruction of Hab-1 meant it made no difference where they landed. Pettengill contends that Santon should still accept some responsibility, 
but Santon insists that he didn't fail. Pettengill admits that he approached Santon to offer him forgiveness, but Santon is unrepentant and arrogant. In frustration, Pettengill hits him in the head. When Santon loses his balance, Pettengill tries to grab him, but he falls off the cliff. Pettengill returns to have one and claims that Santon killed himself by jumping off the cliff. Soon, Gallagher runs out of oxygen and begins to suffocate. Not long after, Pettengill and Birkenall also deplete their oxygen supply. As Gallagher struggles to breathe, he opens his helmet and discovers that the air is breathable. After they all take off their helmets, Birkenall remarks that Santon would have been encouraged to keep going if he had only waited a few more minutes. Houston contacts Mars One to inform Bowman that the space station's orbit will fail in 31 hours, but they assure her that they'll help her leave Mars orbit by that time. As the ground crew searches the area for a radio transmitter, Birkenall realizes that they could use the radio on the rover sent there in 1997, but with the sun setting, it would be too cold to start looking for the rover. Instead, they'll wait till morning. When it gets dark, Gallagher ignites the remaining rocket fuel and have one to keep themselves warm as they try to sleep. Amy soon finds the crew and Gallagher discovers that it required some damage. When Birkenall learns that they can use Amy's navigational systems, he suggests shutting down the robot so that they can retrieve the device. Upon hearing this, Amy activates its defensive protocols. The robot designates the crew as threats and attacks them. Gallagher tries to deactivate it, but the robot tosses him through the air. Birkenall attempts to hit Amy with a large metal pipe, but the robot effortlessly slices it into small pieces. Amy breaks one of Birkenall's ribs and runs away. Gallagher notes that the robot only left them alive because it was using guerrilla tactics. It wounded Birkenall so that it would slow them down. He warns the crew that the robot will eventually return to kill them one by one. Before the sun rises, the crew leaves Hab 1 to look for the rover. Bowman sends another message to Houston to inform them that she will look for the crew before leaving Mars's orbit. When the ground crew finds the rover, Gallagher discloses that their mission is not using the same frequency as the rover's radio, but he stresses that it's still worth a try. The ground crew doesn't get any response after two hours of communicating with the space station. Houston sends Bowman a message instructing her to adjust her frequency to contact the ground crew. As Gallagher gets ready to throw the radio away, he suddenly hears Bowman's voice. Bowman is delighted to hear that they've survived. Gallagher informs her that Chantalus and Santon are gone, and they could join the dead crew members soon because they have no food or water. Bowman tells them to hold on while she comes up with a way to rescue them. Later, Bowman instructs them to find Cosmos, an old Russian probe that failed to launch. She notes that the probe's designer, Borokovsky, believes it's still possible to initiate the launch sequence on site. They only have 19 hours to launch Cosmos. If they take any longer, Mars One wouldn't have enough fuel to return to Earth. After terminating the communication, Bowman reminisces about the time Gallagher almost kissed her when he complained that he's distracted every time he sees her leave the shower. As the ground crew head to the site of the probe, Amy follows them from a distance. Pettengill notices movement in the valley ahead of them, but the others disregard his observation. Not far from the crew, several insects start moving on the ground and they seem to be crawling in the same direction as the crew. Later on, Bowman contacts Gallagher and informs him that Cosmos can only hold two people. Gallagher withholds the information from the other crew members as they continue their journey. After a few hours, Birkenall can no longer walk on his own because of his rib injury, so Gallagher helps him. Soon, Bowman contacts the crew again to warn them that an ice storm is coming their way. The trio take refuge in a small cave as they wait for the storm to pass. Gallagher eventually confesses that Cosmos can only hold two of them. He tells them that he'll help them launch the probe but he will stay behind. Pettengill is doubtful that they'll let him board Cosmos because he knows that Birkenall suspects him of killing Santon. When the two men fall asleep, Pettengill takes the radio and runs to the probe. However, Amy intercepts him. Amy turns on the signal for the video monitor on Gallagher's arm so they can watch it kill Pettengill. On their way to retrieve the radio, they discover algae growing on the ground. When Birkenall inspects Pettengill's body, he is baffled to see his helmet closed. Unbeknownst to him, insects are crawling all over Pettengill's corpse. Birkenall tries to remove the helmet by burning it with a torch lighter, but he is startled when the fire ignites the insects infesting the body. Birkenall deduces that the insects are nematodes, and they're feeding on the algae. He places two nematodes in a tube before going on their way to the probe. Birkenall concludes that Mars has a breathable atmosphere because the nematodes eat algae and release oxygen as a byproduct. When they come across a valley covered in algae, the nematodes start attacking Birkenall because of the blood dripping from his mouth. Birkenall throws his suit to Gallagher and tells him that he's going to need it for air. He also gives Gallagher the test tube and instructs him to take it back to Earth. As the nematodes start to cover half of his body, Birkenall lights the torch to ignite himself and the insects. Bowman sees the fire from space and contacts Gallagher to find out what happened. Gallagher discloses that Birkenall sacrificed himself to incinerate the insects. 
Gallagher loses hope that he'll return to Earth, but Bowman urges him to keep going so Birkenall's sacrifice won't be in vain. Bowman adds that he should go back for her, if he won't do it for Birkenall. Gallagher runs to the probe when he sees Amy's drone flying over the area. When he reaches Cosmos, Bowman gives him instructions on how to activate the vehicle. Bowman notes that the probe is supposed to go all the way back to Earth, but he lacks food and water, so she instructs him to purge fuel so it would only have enough power to reach Mars's orbit. As Gallagher reconfigures the machine, he discovers that it can't launch because the battery is dead. Gallagher tells Bowman to leave because she won't have enough fuel to get back to Earth if she stays in orbit. Gallagher informs Bowman that there's life on Mars, and they ate Hab-1 and the algae. He relays Birkenall's hunch that the nematode's ability to produce oxygen could save Earth. Gallagher tells Bowman that he will miss her, and Earth. He regrets not kissing her before, and Bowman agrees that he should have done it. Soon, Gallagher loses contact with Bowman as the space station hovers on the other side of the planet. Moments later, Gallagher sees Amy's drone flying by the sea. He surmises that he can use the robot's batteries as an alternative power source to launch Cosmos. Gallagher makes a few adjustments on the probe and waits for Amy to attack. Gallagher looks at the monitor to determine Amy's location, but the robot soon switches off the feed. When Amy emerges, the robot examines his vitals and aims for his heart. Amy lunges at him, and Gallagher dodges the attack. He launches an airbag soaked in fuel to cover the robot and sets Amy on fire. The robot activates its self-destruct protocol. Gallagher takes Amy's battery before its drone can return to blow up the robot. As soon as he grabs the battery, the drone hits the robot and causes a powerful explosion. As Bowman prepares to leave Mars's orbit, Gallagher uses the battery to launch Cosmos. Bowman aborts the space station's departure when she sees Cosmos flying towards the ship. Gallagher runs out of air while Bowman tries to retrieve the probe. By the time Bowman reaches Cosmos, Gallagher is already unconscious. Bowman takes the probe inside Mars 1 and immediately performs CPR on Gallagher to revive him. When Gallagher regains consciousness, Bowman instructs the AI to return to Earth. Soon after, Bowman sends the genetic information of the nematodes back to Earth. She tells Gallagher that people on Earth consider him a hero for what he went through. When Bowman sees him holding a small rock, she asks him if he's keeping it as a souvenir. Gallagher discloses that he's taking it back to Earth to give to Chantilla's granddaughter. After she comments that he's different from how she thought of him, Gallagher kisses Bowman in her journal. Bowman notes that she will have six months to get to know Gallagher before they reach Earth. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.